God's word, faithfully preached, is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives, delivering them from the shackles of sin, the flesh, and the world, and transforming them into useful vessels through whom Jesus can pour out his blessings. Living Seed invites you to a feast of the truth as God's servant brings to us the word of life.
Okay, we praise the Lord. And we are now going to hand it over to our brother, Brother Billy. Sir, we hand it to you. I thank you very much, Scott. Uh, we thank God for bringing us again to the Bible study today. And we give all the praise and honor to the Lord for the opportunity he has given to us to come together. We'd like to uh, pray together right away. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity you have given to us again, even to gather around the word of God in different parts of uh, the nations where you have been gathering us. We thank you for the different centers where we have people that gathered as uh, classes, as groups, to follow the Bible study and to adopt it as their own study. We thank you for other places where it is being translated or interpreted into their own local languages for this same study to go on. We give you praise for all of us in different parts and those who just sit in their homes, in their cars, to follow this uh, study at this time. We desire that in every case and for every soul, please open the heavens. Let your blessing pour upon us and let your word mix with faith in our hearts. Thank you because of what you are doing in our midst, the way you are working to prepare us for your uh, appearing. We just ask you, Father, that your word will meet with faith in our hearts. It will do us good. It will advance us in your work and our relationship with you will keep growing. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity again to have the word of God and shared among ourselves. Take all the glory, Lord. Now, Lord, as we turn to you, we ask for the eyes of our understanding to open. We ask that you lend us your utterance. We ask that you give us insight into the oracles. Let your word come freely. Let it come simply. Let it come with grace. Let it mix with faith in our hearts. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. We also thank God for the a uh, special song from the brethren from Ghana. I need you every hour. Uh, you can never over sing that song. That's what we cry over all the time. And because we are looking at blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That song is just very appropriate uh, to express our hunger for him our hunger for his presence, our hunger for his, his very life uh, to be made manifest in us. Uh, this, uh, we have gone over for a while on the kingdom lifestyle, which we have been working through. And by last week, we came to the end of looking at blessed at the meek. And we uh, came to that conclusion looking at the fact that the meek will inherit the earth. There are many, many battles that the strong, the energetic will always lose. The meek will win those battles because he has learned to defy everything to God the Almighty who can fight on his behalf. We said that the meek is not agitated, not struggling for anything, is not grabbing any position. Now we did note, and I again want to repeat that as I introduce this next B attitude, hunger and thirst after righteousness, that these studies that God is allowing us to go through the kingdom lifestyle, as we have tagged it, it is the lifestyle of the kingdom. It is what should become our lifestyle. Uh, if you are a child of God and 
you have been born into the kingdom of God, then there is no other way to live. There's no other way to operate and find the fullness of the kingdom of God at work in you, except you go this way. And again, I want to note that we are rats. Several things that Jesus said and uh, spoke about in the midst of the multitude, other, other by the instance of uh, somebody would just ask a question or the other. But this particular series that we are going through is what Jesus Christ deliberately sat down to teach, to speak to those who, are, who have been called to be with him. So I want you to note that because he sat down and opened his mouth and taught them saying, and you will notice that this particular uh, series from chapter five all through to chapter seven was Jesus speaking without any interruption. So if you want to understand what is it that Jesus Christ actually released as the principles of the kingdom, as a way a man can operate and he will succeed. Principles of how to do things. I'm trusting that as we go in through this, we will go through it step by step as God will permit us. But before we go on again, I must remind you that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was concluding, he said, whosoever heareth these things of mine, and doeth them. I will liken him to a wise man who has built his house upon the rock. Again, I want to quickly note that these principles that God is letting us go through, they are the principles by which you build an enduring life. They are the principles by which you build an enduring capacity to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. They are the principles by which you can build a destiny that will stand every hazard of life. It is these principles by which you can actually have an enduring ministry in the kingdom of God. Now, all these things that Jesus sat down to teach his disciples, they were the things he was expecting that these men that will become his apostles tomorrow, will, they will take note of, they will pay close attention to, and it will become their lifestyle. And when he said, all the things which I have taught you, go ye into all the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all the things that I've taught you. Now, these are the things that Jesus sat down to teach. That's why it's our own mandate as well to teach this, to instruct anyone who is planning to make it to heaven, anyone who is planning to have a space with God in the purpose of God and the kingdom, we need to pay attention to this. So as we go on today again, my prayer is that as you are listening, as you are hearing, you are already building. But the point is, if you do not obey, if you don't, if you hear and you do not do it, it's as if you are bearing, I mean, you are building your life, you are building your destiny, you are building your home, you are building your future, you are building your career, you are building your ministry upon sand. Because no man will be able to withstand the storms of life, the winds that will come, if you are not firmly rooted in these principles of the kingdom of God. So brothers and sisters, may I say to you that this is not optional. If you sincerely want to be a bona fide a member of God's kingdom, and if you want to actually live to express the kingdom life, and you want to live a life that pleases God, there is no alternative to this. There's no other thing we can do that will be an alternative to these principles that Lord 
is beginning to show us. The second point or the third point I should raise is that Jesus actually kept introducing and said, blessed, blessed, blessed. You see, there's the blessedness of these principles when you imbibe them. You are going to be blessed if you will walk in this reality. So my prayer today is that as we go ahead, pressing on with these important bedrocks for a strong and lasting relationship with Jesus, the Lord will himself uh, empower you and help you to walk in the, in the reality of the truth that we are going through, particularly today by the grace of God. Now, so I'd like us to go ahead now and look at where we are. We are now dealing with chapter six of the book, They Who Do Hunger and Test After Righteousness. And our main text is taken from Matthew chapter five, as we have been going, Matthew five. And today our text will be Matthew five and verse six. Matthew 5, 6 will be our text. And we want to begin by looking at it very deliberately. Now, what we have done, if you have the book, is that we have uh, taken that verse from several versions of the Bible that we can check. But uh, since we are all here on the platform, we can read by ourselves. And those who don't have the book, they can follow us. Now, the New King James Version, let's begin by asking Sister Sherry to pick Matthew 5.5 5 from the New King James Version. Uh, if Sister Natalie has um, good news, we ask you to come on good news for us. And um, the ones that we don't have as we are sitting here, we'll read it from the... Um, outline as we have set it out. Sister Sherry, can you begin? Matthew 5, 6. Matthew 5, 6, New King James Version. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. They shall be filled. Amen. Thank you. Good news? Good news. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. Wow. Wow. I love you. Read it again. Mr. Natalie? Yes, sir. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God mm -hmm. will satisfy them fully. All right. So we're noting now that when we said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, King, the good news has put it as those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires and that God will satisfy them fully. All right. Uh, Brother Scott, any of the versions you have? You have uh, amplified? Brother Scott? On yes, sir. Time. Amplified. All right. Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous in that state in which the born again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. All right. Again, we are noting. And we're coming back on all of this, the issue of uprightness, right standing with God, those who hunger and thirst to want to actually maintain a, an upright standing with God, they shall be completely satisfied. Now, uh, in the other versions that we have noted, uh, the Living Bible, I don't think any of you have the Living Bible to read for me? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Okay, Natalie. The Living Bible. Living Bible. 
Yes. Happy are those who long to be just and good, for they shall be completely satisfied. They shall be completely satisfied. That's good. Um, any other version that you can get there that we can add to what we have already? I have the New English Bible here. How blessed are those who hunger and thirst to see right prevail, how they shall be satisfied. The longer, the long, the hunger and test to see right prevail, how they shall be satisfied. And the Jerusalem Bible, uh, I don't think anybody went to Jerusalem of recent. Yes, sir, we have the Jerusalem. All right, can you read it for me? It says, happy are those who hunger and thirst for what is right. They shall be satisfied. Amen. They shall be satisfied. Thank you. Thank you. Now, any other version that is of interest that Sir, somebody wants to? I have the message. Okay. Read the message for us. It says, you're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. His food wow. and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. Wow. Wow. What a message. What a message. Please repeat it again, Sister Natalie. Yes, sir. You're blessed and you've worked up a good appetite. Sorry. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. His food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. Hmm. You are blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He is the food and the best drink that you will ever eat. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think we can go ahead. A Beck's translation put it like, Happy are those who hunger and thirst to be righteous. They will be satisfied. And uh, we will end uh, all the readings uh, with that. I think I just want to check whether Philip's modern English had given us anything else that we could have added to what we are talking about here. He said, uh, blessed, happy are those who utterly and are sincere looking for God. Happy are those who are hungry and thirsty for goodness, for they will be fully satisfied. Thank you. I think we've got enough for us to begin to chew as we go ahead. Now, someone may say, why are we reading all those versions? It's because we want to get all the various shades of meaning, all the various emphasis in which uh, that verse comes as we look at it in the various rendering. And they are all, when you put them together, they give us a composite understanding of what we are longing for. So let's go ahead now to look at what does it mean to be hungry and thirsty. That's the first thing we want to look at now. What does it mean to be hungry and to be thirsty? Now, you see, we have only said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Those who long, whose greatest desire. So we see a bit of the understanding of what it means to hunger and to thirst from the various rendering that we have read, that it will mean to have the greatest desire. It means to long, to long for, and it means to, 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 yes. So now we now want to pick those passages that will help us to quickly see the expression of hunger and thirst as we find in scriptures and in the life of other disciples who are also longing for this experience. 
So we're going to start reading now. We'll ask uh, Brother Scott to start with Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2. Then we'll ask Sister Natalie to read Psalm 63, verse 1. And then Sherry, Sister Sherry, you'll be helping us to read Psalm 107. You read verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7. And then we will now ask uh, Brother Dioye to read Proverbs 27 and verse 7 for us. Shall we go quickly? Scott? Yes, Psalm sir. 40. Yeah. Psalm 42, 1 and 2 in New King James. Yes, sir. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. Psalm 63, verse 1. Sir, Psalm 63, verse 1, the New King James Version. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. There's no water. Thank you. Um, Psalm 107, verse 5, 6, and 9. Yes, sir. Um, King James Version, verse 5. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Verse 9. For he satisfied the longing soul and filled the hungry soul with goodness. Amen. Thank you. Right. Um, I wish I can ask. Uh, okay, do you, you are reading 27, Proverbs 27, verse 7 for us. And Scott, can you go to Psalm 84 and you help us read verse 2 and 3? One, two, three. Yes. Do ye Proverbs? Unmute yourself, Radio ye, and give us Proverbs 27, verse 7. We are not able to connect him. All right. Sister Sherry, can you help us out? Yes, sir. I can read it if you're if it's okay. Proverbs 27, verse 7. It says, The full soul loaded and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Amen. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Brother Scott, Psalm 84. Verses 1 through 3. Yeah. How, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Thank you. Thank you. So all I've been trying to do as we read all these passages was for us to discuss what does it mean to be hungry and to be thirsty. And, and the various passages that we've read had brought us into that as God was beginning to help us. And I want you to look at uh, the various expression that we have got in Psalm 42, Psalm 63, Psalm 84, before we come back to Psalm 107 and Proverbs 27, verse 7, as we've been reading. Now, you will notice that Psalm 42 is expressing what does it mean to be hungry and to be thirsty. And the only way in which he put it, he said, after their hands for the water brooks. So pants my soul for you, O oh God. My soul tests, thirst for God, for the living God. When shall I come 
and appear before God. Now, the first thing we are noting there is when you talk about being hungry and being thirsty, this is a very, very, it's like a pang. Actually, it's a pang, it's a panging. Uh, the other, the, the, they are pants. You see, when you use the word pants, it's, it's, it's breathing restlessly because of thirst. And anytime you have seen deers, when they are, when you see them thirsty, you see the way they rush for the water brooks. So when a person is thirsty, you don't need to mobilize him again. You don't need to push him. He's thirsty. He's looking for a refreshing. And I dare say to you that thirst is a more, it's even stronger a need to be met in somebody's life, even their hunger. Sometimes a person can survive without eating food, but if water is lacking, oh, it's very dangerous. So we saw that hunger and thirst, they are the deep yearning, a keen appetite, something that makes you internally you know, restless until it is met. It is, it is sometimes you call it hunger pan, that, that is as if something is flogging you inside and say, oh, you have no eating, you have no eating, you have no eating. As if somebody is flogging you inside, you are thirsty, you are thirsty. You know that when somebody is thirsty, is gasping as well. So when we say blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, we are beginning to note that these people, their greatest desire, their greatest pangs and panting is for righteousness, is to have a living, functional relationship with God, right? And in Psalm 63, it was expressed again in a very, very strong manner. He said, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. I am thirsty for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I'm longing, I'm longing, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty for you. But you will note that in each of the passages we are reading, they are not just thirsty for ordinary water. They are not just hungry to eat food. Their hunger and their thirst is for the Lord himself. Say, my soul thirsts for you. My soul longs, my flesh longs for you. My, you see, I'm hungry for you. Early will I seek you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water, it's you I am looking for. And that was why when our sister helped us to read Matthew 5, 6 from message, you know, it was very interesting. He said, when, when you walked up, when you walked up and hunger, you know, and hunger for God, when your, 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 your pang, your hunger pang is worked up, is aroused, you know, for God. And I know what it means when uh, some of us, there are certain things to take, maybe like an appetizer, or you, you just take something that releases your hunger pang. You find yourself shivering, you can't wait again until they bring your full course of meal. And at such a point, you consume it without thinking, without looking left or right, because you are hungry. And so when we came to look at Psalm, I mean, we, we look at Psalm 84, uh, which I've added to our text today. That was not that, but you could add it if you wish. Psalm 84, we look at that verse 1 and verse 2, particularly said, how lovely is your tabernacle, Lord of hosts. 
my soul longs. Yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So what we are noting is that hunger, hunger is a longing for that makes you to have a feeling of a fainting. As if, if something is not given to you, you are going to faint. You are going to even collapse. Hunger for God's presence, hunger for righteousness. Then my heart and my flesh cry out. It cries out because there is hunger pants inside of you. But now I want us to look at that 107, Psalm 107, 5, 6, and 9 that uh, we read, and then Proverbs 27, 7. It gives us a perspective again about what we have been discussing about being hungry and being thirsty. Now, 107, uh, Sister Sherry, you read it before, but I want you now to come with it uh, and just read it uh, little by little for us. 107 verse 5. Yes, sir. Verse 5. Hungry verse five. and thirsty. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. In them. So again, when somebody is hungry and is thirsty, there is something inside that is longing, that is fainting, that is saying, if I don't have him now, I am finished. And how we pray that this kind of hunger and thirst for God for righteousness will become your lifestyle. That's what we're looking at. A man that is not hungry. So we are coming, I'm coming to draw all those conclusions once we have settled what we are saying. Now, verse six and verse nine, let's ask you to read it again. Verse six. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Mm. Verse 9, for he satisfied the longing soul and filled the hungry soul with goodness. Amen. He satisfies the longing soul. The emphasis I'm drawing there is longing, longing. Hunger and thirst creates a longing, a yearning, a desire, an intense desire that cannot be filled or fulfilled unless what you are desiring for has come to you, right? Now, but when you go to Proverbs 27, verse 7, which we read, let's repeat it, 27, 7, uh, because it shows something. It said, a satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. But a hungry soul, every bitter thing to him is sweet. Did you understand the meaning of that? What it means that when a man is full of himself, even if you give him honey, he will loathe it. He will treat it as useless. But to a, an hungry soul, to that person that is thirsty, to that person that is, that is thirsty, you see what it says? He said, to a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Because what he's longing for is not just taste. He's longing for the, the fulfillment of a thirst. Thirst is a bigger force than taste. Actually, taste is only useful when you are not hungry, when you are not thirsty. That's when you say, let me just taste whether I like it or not. But when somebody is thirsty, even taste does not matter anymore. A person who is, to a person who is hungry, even bitter things is sweet because it is meeting and an hunger and a thirst 
in his heart. Now, permit me to now begin to speak into this, that what does it mean to be hungry and to be thirsty from what we are saying, it is to be longing, to be longing, to be yearning, to have an inner and innate desire, an unquenchable desire that is never satisfied until what you are looking for has been given to you. And if your hunger and your thirst is for God, then nothing else can fill that vacuum in your life until, until you have encountered him. So, and you can't say you are looking for God and you are not looking for a right standing with God. So when we are talking about what does it mean to be hungry and to be thirsty, it means to have a longing. And you see that in different of the passages we have read, he said, yea, my heart and my flesh cries out for the living God. He said, my heart longeth, my soul even fainted. You see, all of those are a sign of someone who is hungry, someone who is thirsty, someone who is having an innate desire, innate desire for God. Now, permit me to note before I go away from that, that if a man is no more hungry, even physically, physically that for the past uh, two months, you've not been hungry. Your wife say, come and eat. He say, I'm not hungry. And for one month, you have not been hungry. Two months, you are not hungry. Uh, will your wife keep quiet? You become an emergency. Because hunger is a sign of being healthy. Hunger is a sign that you are healthy. When you have a man or a woman who is no more hungry, is no more healthy. And permit me to say, that when you are no longer hungry and thirsty for spiritual things, you are no more hungry for God. You are no more hungry for the things of the spirit. You are no more hungry even for righteousness, for wanting to have a right standing with God. Let me quickly say to you, you are no more healthy. Your spiritual life is sick. There are so many, many people that they claim to be Christians. But this very, very basic attitude for a healthy spiritual life is already missing in their lives. They are not hungry for anything. They are not thirsty for anything. They are just like that. They are complacent. Even honeycomb, they have no taste for it. They load things. And so you see in their lives, they are very critical. They will come and mark the grammar of the preacher. They will first look at how he dress. All of those things that shows that something is omitted in their lives. When you are no more hungry for God, when you are no more hungry for the word of God, when you are no more hungry for righteousness, my dear brother, Let's call a spade a spade. You are sick. You are sick. When the hunger you used to have, that desire you have to let's go to the presence of God, let me just go and pray. Let me just seek the face of God. You wake up early in the morning, there is no hunger to pray, no desire to be with God. You just dress up like that. And maybe it's on the road, you just, you, just, you just do the sign of the cross and say, mm, mm, like that. May I inform you, you are sick. You are on a danger list. The reason is because what draws the blessedness of God, what releases heaven into a man's soul is hunger. You know, hunger and thirst is one particular trait 
you don't teach children to hurt. You know that as soon as a child is born, there are other things we train children for, but you don't train children on how to suck. The truth of the matter is that they come into the world hungry. They come into the world thirsty. You see the child is thirsty. He wants to suck. If you are genuinely born again, and you see that all of us, when you are born again, when you are genuinely born again, one of the signs that shows that, yes, a new life has begun in your life is hunger. Hunger for the word of God. Hunger for the presence of God. Hunger. Hunger to be right with God. Hunger to stand straight. And one of the critical signs of backsliding is when you lose hunger. Oh, they say, can we go for fellowship? She said, well, no, I don't have time. That thing is too long. Uh, I don't think I'll have time for that. And then one week, two weeks, three weeks is becoming your lifestyle. Not to have time for God. You are sick. You are sick. You are, your, your, your soul is not in a good state. If the trumpet sounds today, I doubt whether you will even have hunger to want to go with him. So when we begin to look at this and Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and test after righteousness, I want you to know that for Jesus to raise that as a critical principle of the kingdom life, it is very critical indeed. It is because only to the hungry soul we go satisfied. Only to the thirsty shall be filled. You will see as we go on, he said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So when a man is not thirsty, you cannot even experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When you are not hungry, God cannot release fresh revelation of his word to your life. When you are not thirsty, God cannot eh, begin to pamper you with spiritual things. You will trample upon it. So permit me to quickly say to you that to be hungry and to be thirsty is a lifestyle, is an attitude of the kingdom. And anyone who makes progress in working with God we must pray that you don't lose hunger for him. We must pray that you don't lose your test for spiritual things. And may I say to you, anytime you sense that you are beginning to become complacent, you are beginning no longer to be hungry. There's nothing, there's no pang inside of you again. There's no panting after God. I will call on you to take a retreat. And when they say, what are you retreating for? He said, because my soul is sick and I'm in danger. It is not normal for you to continue day in, day out. And nothing is striking you inside. Nothing is yearning inside your heart for heaven. Nothing is yearning your heart to be with God. Then you are not in a good condition. May God help us in the name of Jesus Christ. So let me ask uh, Natalie to read the summary under number A for us before we go to the next. Yes, sir. It says, what does it mean to be hungry and thirsty? It means to have a strong desire, a deep yearning, and a keen appetite for something. It is a strong craving for something above all else. To be hungry and thirsty at the same time is such a strong and dangerous condition of need that may lead to fainting if nothing is done to assuage them. Such a situation makes one to cry out for help for that need to be met. That's it. That is what I would call the meaning of what it means to be hungry and to be thirsty. It is to have a strong desire, a deep yearning, and a keen appetite. A keen, a keen appetite, sharpened appetite 
for something, a strong craving for something above earth. But in this case of our study, it is not just for something. It is for righteousness. It is for God. It is for Christ himself in your life. And it's a very strong, and I even use the word dangerous, is that if it is not met, you can faint. How I pray that God will create such an hunger for himself in several of our hearts. When you are this hungry for God, I'm telling you, you will make accelerated progress in your work with the Savior. And your experience of, of his grace, of his power, your experience of the truth will be so keen because you are hungry for God. Uh, God himself waits for those that are hungry and thirsty for him, for righteousness, for them to be satisfied fully. Thank you. Now let's go to the second uh, consideration. What does it mean to hunger and thirst after righteousness? Now you see we dealt with what does it mean to be hungry and to be thirsty. Now we are now applying it. What we dare now mean to be hungry and to be thirsty for righteousness. You will remember that all that we have said about hunger and thirst we now want to see how does that apply onto looking for righteousness. Now, Matthew 5, 6, which we have read, has been our basic text on this. And so I'm going to now ask Brother Scott to return again to all the listings that we put forward under the various versions that we have uh, listed out there. Can you read it out for us so that we can pick it up? And then, in order to complete it for our reading today, Natalie, you are going to go back to that, your message, and read Matthew 5 and 6 to us. Yes, Brother Scott. Yes. In New King James, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Good news is happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will okay. satisfy them fully. Right. Before you go on, Scott, so let's now note that according to the King James, said those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, good news now put that. Those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. So when we talk about thirst for righteousness, is a strong desire, a strong motivation to do what God requires. Something inside of you does not want to do anything different from what God requires. Yes, Scott, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Living Bible, happy are those who long to be just and good, for they shall be completely satisfied. They long to be just and good. So when we said those who long, I mean, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, we are noting now that their greatest desire is to do what God requires. Mm -hmm. Their deepest longing is to be just and to be good. They want to be correct. Mm -hmm. They want to stand well. That is their greatest desire. They long for it. They long for it. Yes, my brother, go ahead. NEB says, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst to see right prevail? How right. they should be satisfied. So now you are seeing another dimension to it. Not only that they want to do what God requires, not only that they want to be just and good, they also hunger and thirst to see right prevail. Mm -hmm. They cannot, they cannot, they cannot be untouched. They cannot be unperturbed when right is being pushed aside. Something in them is longing to make sure that what is right is what prevails. They cannot, they cannot sleep 
when, when evil, when compromise, when sin is having the order of the day, they cry and say, Lord, when will righteousness prevail? When you read Psalm 119, you see how the psalmist cried, say, oh Lord, oh Lord, it is time for you to walk because men have made void your word. Now, all such hunger is what makes us to stand for righteousness. Now, we begin now to have Christians that are completely indifferent. They're in a place, wickedness is everywhere, but they look at it with, uh, with impunity. It doesn't touch them. Their heart is not moved, not mobilized. They are not concerned. They say, well, let everybody do what they like. It is that kind of Christian that have lost their hunger for righteousness that has reduced the church to a mere empty organization rather than an organism that is causing a change light that is shining and disposing and dispelling, you know, darkness. Go ahead, my brother. Yes. JB says, happy are those who hunger and thirst for what is right. They shall be satisfied. Good. Beck says, happy are those who hunger and thirst to be righteous. They will be satisfied. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And then amplified. Blessed and fortunate, and happy, and spiritually prosperous in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. So what they are hungry for is uprightness and right standing with God. They want to have an unbroken relationship with God, first in their lives, and then they are concerned that that kind of right uprightness should prevail wherever they are. Now, Natalie, you want to now help us again with your message? Yes, sir. Message Matthew 5, 6. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He is food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. Now, so we're seeing again that these people that we're saying are hungry and thirsty for God. They have worked up a good appetite for God. What they look for in everything is God. Their food, their drink is the Lord. I don't know how to put it. But there's only one Bible verse that comes to my mind when Jesus said, my meat, my meat is to, to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's my meat. That's what I eat. That's what gives me satisfaction. We are looking for believers, disciples, whose meat, whose food and drink is to see God at work in their lives. It will see God, to see Christ Jesus being made manifest in everything they do. And if they don't see Christ, they are forever hungry. They are forever restless. They say, no, 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 I can't be satisfied here. I've not seen Christ's life breaking forth through me and in what I am doing. It is this kind of people that we are looking for. Now, so let's quickly, let's quickly go to look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. We'll read those passages before we come to read the summaries. Now, can you please go to 1 Timothy 6, 9? Uh, we we'll start with Sherry. Sister Sherry, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 9. Uh, Galatians 6, 12, Brother Scott. Matthew 9, 35, uh, Sister Natalie. And the uh, first Corinthians 14, verse 1. If the OJ is available now, it's not available. So I'm available. Will, you're available now. Yes, so sir. You have to read from 14, 1. First Corinthians 14, 1. So let's go on quickly. Yes. Sherry. First Timothy. Yes, sir. First Timothy 6, 9, King James. 
but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Amen. Amen. All right, that's First Timothy 6, 9. Yes, Galatians uh, 6, 12. Yes. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these mm-hmm. would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark 9.35. Yes, Matthew? sir. Uh, I, I had Matthew, not Mark, sorry. It's Mark. Mark 9, 35 from the New King James Version. And he sat down, called the 12, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all, the, of all and servant of all. All right. Thank you. Now, you will see that all the series we have read, now it remains 14 1, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Yes, sir. It says, uh, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. All right, thank you. Now, we brought this series of passages to give you a contrast. All these passages, you will see that if 1 Timothy 6 9, he talked about those who desire to be rich. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. So again, I want you to know that the strong desire, when we talk about those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, there could be some others who hunger and thirst to be rich. They wake up hungry for money. They sleep thirsty for money. All their discussion is only, in fact, when they see human beings, they only see dollar in them. And they are only thinking, how can I make more money out of these people here? That is all that matters to them because it's a hunger. Is a passion, it's a longing. Those who long to be rich, they fall into temptation and a snare. There are some people listening to me now. Maybe your hunger is to be rich. You are simply saying, look, no, forget all this thing. Let me just make it. Let me just, I need a breakthrough. And what is the breakthrough you are looking for? Just money. And that's why you are falling into all kinds of snares. Any little thing attracts you. Then that's why you can fall into the scams. That's why you can find yourself in fraudulent practice and they take you captive. You say, oh no, they cheated me, they cheated me. Why will you not be cheated? Because your hunger is to be rich. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So you can be hungry and thirsty to be rich, but that's what it will draw you into. It drowns men. It will, it will get you drowned. You know, when you use the word drown. It's like somebody just suddenly falls into the sea and he does not know how to swim. And you are just seeing yourself nose diving down, down. And if God does not rescue you, you are gone. Now, there are some others whose desire is not for righteousness, whose hunger is not for righteousness. As we read, it's for show. The desire for show a desire for presentation, a desire for good appearance. They can spend three hours before the dressing mirror. They are touching this, they are touching that, they are cutting this, they are doing all of that. 
They can spend hours just turning their air around. And when you go inside, so what is it all about? Just for sure. So it can be an hunger. Hunger for sure. You just come out and you see a new fashion of dress. No matter how many dresses you had in your wardrobe, they are useless. They are useless until you get that. That's hunger and test for show, for passion, for appearance. There are people that, why they don't have hunger for God, why they don't have hunger for righteousness, they have hunger for something else. And that's the next thing I want to say to you. There is no man that is really alive that does not have hunger. Some have hunger for girls. Anywhere they go, no matter the crowd, they don't see anybody else. They don't see, they only look, their eyes only see women. You remember how Samson, anywhere he went, whether he went to Sorek or he went to Gaza or he went to Gath, anywhere he went or he went to Ashdod, the Bible said he saw a woman. And I was wondering, brother, Samson, why don't you have eye for anything else? It's because your hunger, your thirst, is what determines your vision in life. So let's take note now that if you are not hungry for righteousness, you are definitely hungry for something else. You can neither be hot nor cold. The truth of the matter is that once you are no more hungry for the word of God, something else has taken your appetite something else. And so we are asking, what is it? So he said, if anyone desires, again, there are people that are hungry for leadership. They are hungry, you know, to be on top. They are hungry for position. But Jesus said, yes, if you really desire and you are so hungry to, to lead, then you better agree to become the slave of everyone else. But such people, they don't like that. They don't like to serve. They don't like to be a servant. They want to be on top. They want to see. They want to be directors. That's their hunger. So when they come for any place, if you don't put them on top, then nothing's happening there. If it's not the one conducting, everybody else is making a mistake. It's an hunger. So we're going to be checking this evening, or this morning rather, we're going to be checking what are you hungry for? What is your greatest desire in life? What is the thing that is riding you? What is the thing that is motivating your life? What are you, what, what is the motivation for your living? What are you hungry for? What do you want to become? This is very important. You cannot be without an hunger. But if your hunger is not for God, then your hunger is for something else. And you need to check that. And that will be the question that we are going to pick up. Let me ask God now to pick the summary under that section B and read it for us to go. Yes. It means to have the greatest desire to do what God requires. Mm -hmm. Longing and panting for righteousness out of a need or an emptiness within. It means to long to be just and good, to mm -hmm. hunger and thirst to see right prevail. Yes. Examine your heart. What is the greatest desire of your heart? Do you long to be just and good? Is it your greatest desire to do what God requires, or is it just one of your desires? So, brothers, sisters, wherever you are, let's ask this question. What are you hungry for? What is the test of your life? Honestly speaking, if you are not tested for that which is eternal, Whatever else your test is, you will soon get drowned. 
you get drowned. The truth of the matter is that anything else you test for can never satisfy you fully. You will see that in all the various passages we read, all the rendering of Matthew 5, 6, he said they shall be filled. They shall be satisfied fully. They will be completely satisfied. I want you to know that it is only hunger for God, hunger for righteousness, hunger for Jesus at work in your life that can bring you full satisfaction. Hunger for anything else, please permit me to tell you, there is nothing else you hunger for in this life that satisfies you, none. If you are hungry for girls, I want to inform you, you can never have enough of them. When Brother Solomon began to be, to be hungry for women, you know he married 700 wives and he had 300 concubines. And he said, anything that is I see, he never denies it. So I can imagine that anything skirt and blouse that Solomon looks at, he must get it. And no matter what it will cost to get that lady, God them. Until he alone had 1,000 women. And I was wondering, how is he managing to sleep with them? We have only 365 days in a year, which means he must have done a roster of having to sleep with three women every day. What kind of life is that? No wonder at the end of his own life, the conclusion of his life is vanity. He said, all is vanity. In fact, he died sorrowfully. Even the kingdom that God was building for him, he died poorly. Even before anything, somebody rose against him. And there was not even not for the sake of David, nothing would have been left in the remembrance of Solomon. It's because when your hunger is not for God, anything else you are hungry for does not satisfy. You remember that song we used to sing? It said, like the woman at the well, I was seeking things that could not satisfy. I was going up and down, looking up and down for something that could not satisfy. But when I met my Jesus speaking, Say, draw from my well that never shall run dry. And that woman said, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up to you, Lord. Come and quench this thirsty soul of my heart. So the question we are raising is this. If your hunger is not for God, you are in an endless, insatiable pursuit. You can never be satisfied. If your hunger is for knowledge, oh, look at what Brother Solomon concluded. He said, of making of many books, there's what? There's no end. And of much research is just a weariness to the soul. If that was your hunger, by the time you have spent the rest all of your life running up and down, you will still come back with that hollowness inside you. Many, many professors in this world have died frustrated. They have died with hollowness in their lives. You may talk about them on the outside, but they themselves inside, they feel a void. It's because what they hungered for, what they tested for, what they ran for was nothing that satisfies. So I want to ask you, what are you looking for? What's your hunger? What's the hunger of your life? Let's say to it now. My dear brother, if your hunger is not for God, I say you are sick. If you are not thirsty for that which will make you have a right standing with God, a relationship with God, a growing intimacy with the Lord Jesus, then you are not in good position at all. Even if you used to be fathered many years ago, 
or you've lost your hunger, you need to report quickly to the intensive care unit of God's own hospital and say, God, I am sick. My soul is in danger. There's need to come back. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be satisfied completely. So the question we ended there with is, do you long to do what God desire? Is that your greatest desire? Or is it just one thing that you put aside while other things have crowded out your life? Please ask yourself before I go ahead, what is the greatest desire of my life? Please be honest about it. What am I hungry for? What is the test of my life? What exactly is driving me? What is it? What is driving my life? And if you cannot get a clear answer to it, it means then there's something. Because if this is not the uppermost cry of your heart, then we need to search out what is going on in your soul. Now, let's go to number C uh, very quickly. I am looking whether we can be able to get beyond that uh, today uh, so that we do not overshoot our space of time here and today. Let's go to number C. How can one become hungry and thirsty for righteousness? And I feel that that's a good place where we are going to draw this matter today. If hunger for righteousness is a blessed attitude, how can I become hungry and thirsty for God? How can I be hungry and thirsty for righteousness? How can that become the hunger of my life? These are the issues we want to quickly deal with. And number one, he said, humble yourself. We are coming back to that condition again. Humble yourself. Now, let's go back. Uh, Sister Sherry, you read Matthew 5, uh, 3 for us. Uh, Natalie, you read Matthew 18, verse 3. And uh, Brother Scott, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. And 2 Kings chapter 3, 16 to 17, do ye. Can we quickly all read it as we go on? Matthew 5, 3. Yes, sir. Matthew 5, 3, King James. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right. But before you leave it, can you get it for us from good news? Yes, sir. Uh, good Please. news. It says, happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. The kingdom yes. of heaven belongs to them. Okay. Amen. Thank you for that. Now, Matthew 18, 3. Matthew 18, 3, the New King James Version says, and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Hmm. Right. Uh, go on. First Peter 2.2 2, with us, Scott. Yes. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you very much. And let's look at the example of the man in uh, 2 Kings 3.16 and 17. 2 Kings... Yes, sir. Yes. Second Kings 3, 16 and 17. And he said, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of dishes. For thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. Right. Thank you. So two things that we are noting quickly here. We are noting that only those who recognize, who know that they are spiritually poor, 
those who recognize the poverty, who are poor in spirit, those who do not have exaggerated sense of their importance, they are the ones that can become hungry for God. They are the ones that can be thirsty for righteousness. For those who are full of themselves, the Bible said, they, are, they even loathe the honeycomb. They don't have appetite even for the things of heaven. They are too full of self. So to be hungry and to be tested for righteousness, the first thing is to come to the end of yourself. Humble yourself. I again want to thank the uh, choir last week uh, from Canada that gave us that very important song that if thou would have the dear Savior from heaven, Walk by your side from morning till evening. There's a rule that each day you must follow. Humble yourself to walk with God. He cannot walk with the proud or discomfort. God has nothing to do with the proud or discomfort. So if you are going to be hungry for righteousness, the need to humble yourself becomes very critical. And actually it is arrogance that makes you to become indifferent unto the things of heaven. It is arrogance and self-exaggeration that makes you to lose your hunger. Because for whatever you think you know now, there is so much that you did not know. Whatever you think you have now is infinitesimally small compared with what God is keeping in store for you. If not because of arrogance, how will you lose your hunger for greater things? How will you lose your thirst for the deeper things of God? And so Jesus said, unless you are converted and you become like a small child, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of God. And you know that one of the character of a child is hunger. You will notice that a child cannot survive hunger and thirst. A small child, if he's thirsty, oh, everybody here will know that this child is thirsty. As soon as he sees the mother, he grabs because there is that hunger. And so first Peter chapter two say, as newborn babes desire, desire the pure meek of the word of God. Though you use as uh, uh, young babes, for me, I'm wondering whether I'm not still a babe as far as the things that heaven is keeping in store for me is concerned. Eh? If you are thinking in terms of the volume of the grace that we are yet to receive, how old are you? How, how far have you gone? Except you are just being unnecessarily arrogant. Look at the volumes of scriptures. Look at since the time we started just studying kingdom lifestyle. We are still in Matthew chapter 5. We have not passed verse 6. And see how many weeks we have gone through. And I know those of you that are not hungry say, Matthew, I finished that match. I know it. I know it. Eh? Pure and sheer arrogance will not allow you to dig into the treasures that God has kept in store for you. Now, you must have to be humble. And so the Bible said in that second Corinthians, I mean, Kings 3, it said, make this valley full of ditches. Dig out, dig out rubbish. Dig out things that have filled your well. Something is not letting the water of life flow through you. Can you bend and let's dig it out. Make this valley full of ditches. Go and dig out rubbish. Go and dig out things that have filled your heart that is making you not to be hungry now. Can you dig it out? so that God can help you. 
Now let's ask uh, Sherry to read that summary for us. Yes. One important character trait of a child is the frequency of hunger more than that of an adult. Mm -hmm. Have you grown so much that you no longer need any more nourishment from the presence of God? The mm -hmm. Lord's greatest desire for us is that we should be with him, learning mm -hmm. of him. That is the one thing he said is needful. Yes. Humble yourself that the hunger of his presence may fill your heart. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you. I pray you do not become that, that adult that is no more hungry for God, that is no more hungry for his presence. Jesus said, he said, matter, matter, you are cumbered about many things. You are bothered about many things, but only one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good portion. Nobody will take it from her. What is that one thing that is needful? Learning, sitting, hungry for God. Never you become too busy. Are you a pastor? You are jumping from pillar to post, going up and down. And everyone is asking, where is this man now? Where is he? We have not seen him for a long time at the throne of grace. We learned that he's preaching there, preaching there. We don't know who sent him. You have lost hunger, hunger for God. Some of you, your hunger now is for the pulpit, not for the presence of God. You are always dressing up to go up and down. Heaven is saying, where is he? We have not seen him in my presence. He's not coming around. What is he doing? He has no hunger for God. He only has hunger to preach, to show up. And you are, you are very, you just love popularity. You just love the public place. You have no hunger for the secret place where eternal things are written to a man's heart. Can I charge you and invite you today? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. There's so much in Christ Jesus that you are here to collect. Whatever you have now, as good as it looks to you, as good as it appears in your eyes, is still so small compared with what heaven is holding out towards you. Humble yourself to walk with God. Thank you. Now, number two, under that section, how can we become uh, hungry and thirsty for righteousness? Ask God for help to make you hungry by showing you your true spiritual condition, how you measure on the scale of his righteousness. A revelation, a reality of who you are will help you to be able to develop fresh hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let's go back to uh, our scriptures. And now we're going to ask Natalie to read for us uh, Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Brother Scott, you are going to read Isaiah 6, 1 to 6, and 12, 11, Sister Sherry. Shall we try? Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Sister Natalie. Sir, Deuteronomy Chapter 8, verse 3, in the New King James Version says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but, but, but man lives by every word that, proceeded, that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. All right, thank you. Thank you. We are looking at Hunger, how does God help a man to create hunger? Isaiah 6, 1 to 6. Yes. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. 
And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the poor, the, the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the, to from the altar. Thank you very much. Oh, I thought you would please read verse 7. You've not finished the story. Yes, verse 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Thank you very much. And Hebrews 12, 11. Sister yes, Sheriff. sir. King James. Now, no chastening, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, Afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Amen. Thank you very much. Now, this section, we're saying, ask God for help to make you hungry by showing you your true spiritual condition, how you measure on the scale of his righteousness. And whereas in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, we saw what God wanted to do to the children of Israel by making them to be hungry. He made, his, he made them to suffer hunger, not because he did not have food for them, but he wanted them to have an appetite for something else. He wanted them to know that man cannot can, uh, does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And you will see that once their heart began to yearn, God met all their needs. Some of you, you are too full. And so the reality of your condition, the, 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 the poverty of your spiritual life is not clear to you. You don't know that you're in a very terrible condition for losing hunger. I kept saying it in this meeting today that hunger and test is the condition of being healthy, both physically and spiritually. When you lose hunger, even you lose hunger for food, I have no appetite for food, I have no appetite for food for several weeks you are in a danger list. Something is wrong with your internal system. But it is much more serious when a Christian has lost his hunger for God, hunger for scriptures, hunger for genuine, intimate uh, relationship with God, intimate prayer life. When you are no more hungry to see right prevail, you are no more, it's not your greatest desire to have a right standing with God you are not in a good position. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will call you to order uh, as a result of this meeting today. Now, we saw a very clear illustration. Here was Isaiah. Isaiah was already a prophet, a preacher, who had been speaking everywhere to people, warn to you, warn to you, from all the beginning of the book of Isaiah, we have seen Isaiah, Loudly, loudly, lashing people, lashing people. He speaks about this, he speaks about that. Nobody knew that this man himself has a very chronic need in his own life. How did God bring him to the place of crying? The Bible says, in the year that Uzziah died, he saw the Lord. One of the things I want to pray is that you will see the Lord that God will reveal himself afresh to you. When you see God in his glory, suddenly you will see how filthy 
you will see how inadequate, you will see how empty your life is. Some of you, you are busy comparing yourself with another person. But the Bible said those who compare themselves with themselves are not wise. The standard that God has set for us is not another brother there. It's Christ Jesus. And unless you keep looking at the stature of Christ and measuring where you are, you may not have hunger for growth. You may not have hunger for spiritual development. You might be thinking that you are the best around. But the best around is nothing because in the country of the blind, even if you are one eye, you are going to be their chief. If you are living in the midst of dwarfs, a little high that you have shut up makes you their leader because everyone else, they are just down there. Now, we are talking about God. Opening your eyes to see his glory. Opening your eyes to see what lies ahead of you that you have not got. When Isaiah saw, and he saw the glory of God, he saw the holiness of God, then he saw himself. Then he saw himself in the light of the holiness of God. He said, I am undone. One version says, he said, I am ruined. Another one says, I am, I am finished. Only a man that has seen the reality of who he is will be able to come under such a conviction. And that was when he began to cry, woe is me. Woe is me, woe is me. And that was when a divine visitation came upon his life. We are going to ask God to help us today that he might open our eyes of understanding to see the reality of where we are. Even if God had to chasten you in order to restore your hunger for righteousness, let's ask God to do it. It may not be pleasant, but if it helps you, to desire holiness of life, to be a partaker of his glorious nature. What a, what a wonderful thing. As we finish with this Bible story today, the first thing I want to ask you is, what are you hungry and what are you hungry for? Are you thirsty? What is your thirst all about? What is the meat of your life? Now, permit me to ask Natalie to now read the summary that we have under that section number two before we take the final one. <clears throat> Sister Natalie, can you read the summary for us? Yes, sir. Sorry, I didn't hear my name. There oh. we go. God caused Israel to hunger in the wilderness. He can make you hungry. He showed Isaiah a vision of his glory and holiness. When Isaiah drew near God and saw his holiness compared with his own holiness, he saw his personal poverty. That created a deep desire to be holy in his heart, and he cried out. That can be your experience too. Please pray that God will reveal your true self to you that God will show you where you stand in his scale of a spiritual life. Please don't finish this Bible study without asking God, please reveal myself to myself. Why am I no longer hungry? Why am I become loathsome unto things that I used to rush for? Why is my prayer life no longer, you know, very fervent as it used to be? Why am I now comparing myself with those whom you know are compromisers? Why? Why would they be your yardstick now? People that you used to speak to and they will be, you know, look unto you for, for, for direction. Now you are, you are, be, you are below. You are, you, are, you, are, you are not only that you join their train, but you, are, you have gone below deck. Would you like to pray and say, oh God, please call me out of this slumber, creating me again a new spirit, create hunger in my heart and a test for you. Finally, understand what is God's goal for your life compared 
with your present achievement. That will cause you to create, to have an hunger. Now let's read Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29, Sister Sherry and the brother Scott, you help us read 1 Corinthians 2, 9. That would be our concluding passages for this evening. Romans 8, 29. For whom did he, for whom he did for new, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen. Right. Thank you. And 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Yes. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Right. Now, the goal of God for your life is that you'll be conformed to the image of Christ. The desire of God is that each time you look down, he sees a man in you who is like Christ. The desire that God has for each one of us and what the Bible says, God has kept in store. Eyes have not seen it. Ears have not heard. Where God is taking you, you have not even seen it yet. My brother, why will you stop? Why will you stop? What have you seen yet? Where have you reached yet? Paul was a man who kept understanding the goal that God said for him. said, I have not yet attained. But one thing I do, I forget what lies behind. I am pressing. I am longing. I am pushing forth for what lies ahead. Paul was one man that was forever hungry and thirsty for God. And that's why he continuously made progress until he finished his race. If your hunger for God suddenly dies out, you become stagnant. Your journey becomes, you know, zigzag. We're going to pray together now. Lord, because blessed are those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. Make me thirsty. Make me hungry for you. Give me an insatiable hunger for righteousness, for right standing with God, an insatiable hunger for a desire to become conformed to the image of Christ. Please, Lord, visit me deliberately and give me hunger for yourself. This is where we're going to stop today. I want to ask you, if you are not hungry again, if the hunger, the test you had when you first met the Lord have died out, it is time to return. If you used to have intense desire to be in the presence of God, but now internet has taken you off, you are now in the web and you are now unable to know how to get yourself out. It is time to cry to God and say, God, the biggest thing I need in life is that hunger, that thirsty, that longing for you that keeps me moving from one degree of glory to another. But that hunger is finished. Lord, please visit me again. Maybe even when God brought you into an encounter with Christ, with the cross, and you saw your old man crucified with Christ, it started a great hunger in your heart. You wanted to finish the Bible. You want to read the word of God all the time. You want to read good Christian books. But now, something has happened to that hunger. Something else has replaced it. Can you speak to God directly now and say, God, please help my soul. Draw me nearer. Draw me nearer. Uh, the song that the Ghanaian brethren sang, I need you every hour. I need you this hour. Oh, touch me now, my blessed Savior. I need you now. I need you now. Please, let's pray together. And then I will ask Brother Scott to conclude uh, this meeting today. Let's pray together. Please call on God for yourself. In this minute, you know your condition. You know you have lost appetite for eternal things. You know that even though you are tagging along, you are tagging along, 
for that thing that used to boil inside you, that panting after God is dead. You need a touch. Tell God, touch me one more time. Touch me one more time. Touch me one more time. If the brethren on the, from South Africa were on the platform, I would have said, please sing for us. Touch me once more. I need that touch once again. I need your touch. I need your touch once again. But because I'm not sure they're there, let's just pray together. Holy Spirit, this day we ask, we need a touch. We need a touch, Lord. A touch that will bring a change. A touch that will restore our hunger for you. That will restore our thirst after you. There's so much in you that we need to suck. But when we lost our sucking capacity, oh my God, we became complacent. Please do a new thing for all those who are listening to your word today. And they are crying, say, Lord, this meeting must bring back my hunger for God, my hunger for righteousness, my hunger for personal growth, my hunger for scripture. Lord, please visit them. Wherever they are, whether they're in Syria, no, or Liberia, or Nigeria, or Kenya, oh God, wherever men are following this study, in Europe, in America, in Belize, in Canada, anywhere, oh God, where people are, and they're saying, Lord, touch me once more. Please, Lord, visit us today. Restore our hunger, our thirst for you, our thirst for your word, our thirst for uprightness, standing right with you. Let it be so, as we ask this night, in Jesus' name, amen. This has been Living Seed. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703-036369, 0703-768198. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org.